Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. David, do you mind terribly if I turn on the radio? Yes, I'd mind terribly if you turned on the radio. Mm, he's afraid of that. What do you want to turn on the radio for? To hear a program. What do you think? To hear a program? What program? Well, just about this time a woman comes on to talk about food. Oh, I'd rather eat it. That's just the point, darling. This afternoon I listen. Tonight you eat. Mm-hmm. What do I eat? Uh, today it's... Let me see, let me see. Lemon meringue pie. Mm. Mm. What about the radio in the bedroom? Well, Bertha's vacuuming. It always sounds as if it's coming out of the loud speaker, so... Well, lemon a pie or not, I would like to finish figuring this elevation before dinner. Mm. I came home early especially to do it. Today. Hours till dinner, David. It's hours to figure an elevation. All right, do your work. I will miss my program today. You don't have to sound so martyred about it. I am martyred. Radio in the car. Oh, that's all right, David. Don't think about it another minute. 14, I'll get along without listening 20. to the radio. Really, I will. 14, oh, so nice having 14, you home. I guess there's a price for everything. 14, 14, You're getting off 14, pretty cheap in the long run. One, four, seven feet, 11 inches by 78 feet, 10. Say, hey, David, mm. you have to have mathematics to be an architect, don't mm-hmm. you? You have to have peace and quiet, too. Why do people always put those two words together? Peace and quiet, I wonder. I'm sure I wouldn't know. Hmm. Oh, the doorbell. David, that's the doorbell. Mm-hmm, I heard it. Now, who do you suppose it is, I wonder? Well, why don't you answer the door and see? Well, if it is the doorbell, it's an interruption. I wouldn't have you interrupted for the world, darling. Mm, much you wouldn't. <laughs> Tucker here. Howdy, folks. Howdy. Oh, howdy. Come on in, Mr. Tucker. Just remember, David, when he interrupts, he really interrupts. Well, we can't just send him away without a word. I'll make it quick this time. Now, you'll see. To me, you won't talk, but to anybody else who happens to I rang the doorbell just like a stranger and opened the door like a neighbor, playing uh-huh. shape as a fox. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, Mrs. Norton. Greetings to you, Mr. Tucker. Uh, you working, son? Uh, well, I, I, was... I guess even an architect has to work. Uh, Sooner or later, nothing to be ashamed of. Well, uh... Sit down, Mr. Tucker. You are hey, the most yeah. two-faced man, Mr. Norton. One face says it has to work on an elevation. The other says it can make small talk. Now, remember this. Never fear, my husband. Uh, what's she talking about, son? <laughs> Nothing. You you know women, Mr. Tucker. Yes, I surely do. Always talking women is. Wind themselves up in the morning and keep going till night, and they're all unwound. That's women, all right. <laughs> and that is loyalty, all right. My husband and my neighbor. Now, what is it I can do for you, Mr. Tucker? Why, I, uh, I come over to make some plans with you, son, about spring plowing. Oh? Spring plowing? Spring you, uh, plowing? Yes. You plan on cultivating the meadowland? Well, all but, uh, what I need for pasturing the cow. Right, that's just so I figured. Well, this here's the scheme I cookied up. I'll make it short. You right. got the labor and I got the machinery. Right. I figure you can use my farm equipment, my plow, my harrows, and my team, and such. And your man, Fritz. Well, we'll work our fields as if the whole were one. The whole kit and caboodle together and save ourselves a heap of pennies. Well, Mr. Tucker, isn't it a little early in the winter to be talking about spring plowing? Them what says there's plenty of time ain't got no knowledge of life. I bow. It is perfectly all right with me. I don't mind. I was just thinking that if you two were going to talk about spring, I could turn on my radio program. David, you, you wouldn't mind too much, would you? Radio. All the women got to listen to the radio. Thank you for consenting, David. You go ahead with your plans. Don't mind me. I'll turn it on soft. Unless, of course, I disturb you. Not at all, ma'am. It's free country, comparative. <clears throat> well, Mr. Tucker, I I certainly do appreciate your proposition, and I'll... Instead of the program regularly scheduled to be broadcast at this time... Oh, my poor little program is not even program on. commemorating Pearl Harbor Day. Today is Pearl Harbor exactly Day. Exactly seven years ago at this very moment. Right. The Japanese dropped their bombs on Pearl Harbor. Their treacherous attack, occurring in the middle of negotiations for a peaceful settlement of our differences, forced the United States' entry into the Second World War. Seven years ago. And so in memory of that moment, which commenced one of the bitterest and one of the proudest chapters in American history, 
We switch you now to Pearl Harbor for a speech you, uh, by the Commandant of the United Carton? States Naval Base guys, Base son, I don't need nothing to remind me of the things I should not be forgetting. Take it away, Pearl Harbor. I, I don't need no reminders about America's glorious chapters. Come I in, don't. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. So familiar to everyone now. I remember it sounded so romantic, so peaceful. Pearl Harbor. It's a pretty name for a place, isn't it? It was, before those Japanese planes dropped their bombs. And everything happened so fast after that. One day, you'd see a soldier on the street and you'd turn around to stare. The next day, every other man was in uniform. Everything changed, didn't it? Yes. America woke up. A war makes a fine alarm clock. David, what were you doing Pearl Harbor Day? Seems like it's the kind of day you compare notes on, ain't it? <laughs> oh, I was doing a lot of things. I'll bet you my store-bought teeth can tell you where they was. <laughs> I hope you win, Mr. Tucker. You need those teeth worse than I do. Uh, stop bragging, son. When I was your age, I didn't even know what an inlay was. Nope. Now, uh, what was I about to say? Uh, how uh, I spent Pearl Harbor Day. Yes. Oh, how do you know that was on the tip of my tongue? Uh, intuition, maybe. Yep. Well, let me see. Uh, you had a job then, didn't you? At the bottom of the ladder of a large architectural engineering firm. And mighty glad you had it, eh? Oh, you bet I was. <laughs> Still, you had some conscience about the draft and signing up, or you ain't the man I think you are. So when them Japs dropped the pineapples, that's G.I. lingo for explosive, son, mm. on our ships kind of settled things for you, and off you went. You was scareder than a rabbit, more fighting mad than a polecat, and a doggone sight braver than a hound dog. Now, ain't that the way it was? No, it was... It was something like that. Yes, son, that Sunday was a day that decided the course of men's lives and deaths. It's a queer privilege fighting in the war. Mm -hmm. But a great many things are easier in war, Mr. Tucker. In war, you are given your gods to worship. In peace, you have to figure them out for yourself. Quite, uh, quite profound words you're speaking, Mr. Norton. You had an awful lot to lose, didn't you, David? Not as much as I have now. But I had an awful lot to win, too. And you got to keep winning. As I see it, the trouble with most folks is that they're kind of misunderstand the word peace for meaning survival of themselves instead of the survival of their neighbors, you know. Come to think, I was washing my hair. You was what? Washing her hair. <laughs> You'll find, Mr. Tucker, that my wife chooses to wash her hair at all of the most crucial moments in her life. Only I didn't realize it was so crucial. You was only a child. I was twelve. A child, I says. David was going to war. Things had... If things had turned out differently, my whole life would be different, wouldn't it? That strikes me as a masterpiece of understatement. Mama knew what it meant when the news came. I remember she kissed me, and then she went and sat by the window, her knitting in her lap. You see, she... She, she only told me this later, David, after you and I were engaged. We were engaged two whole days, Mr. Tucker. Two, two days. days too long, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Anyway, Mama was engaged to my father when he went overseas in the First World War. I was lucky. I was only 12. No brother, no father, no you. Only you and your hair. Yep. What were you doing seven years ago, Mr. Tucker? Oh, nothing much. We we never had no radio till a few months before that when Delilah discovered them radio operas. She had that blasted machine going night, noon, and day. <laughs> so come that Sunday... We was in the kitchen till I and me, and that dang radio was going and going. I closed my ears to it till all of a sudden a, a voice I heard pulled me right plumb out of my chair. Them Japs had gone and done it. Dang fools. All I can say is it got me so fighting mad. Mm, how well I know. Yep. The first time in my life I was, I was cussed sore that I'd lived to be an old man. Seventy-nine years old I was. Wars to draw young men's blood, not old men's like Tucker's. But like I said, I, I was so cussed sore that I aimed to do something and do it quick by gum just before I busted clean in two. Well, what did you do, Mr. Tucker? Well, I left to Lila, rocking and crying in her chair by the radio, and I took me out to the barn. I hitched up my horse to a plow, and before I knew it, I was turning over the earth in the lower meadow here. There'd been a thaw in the ground was soft. She, she turned over good, like it was in early spring. She knew it was time for her to start growing and giving. My horse and plow and me, we went up and down my fields preparing the land. I guess I hardly knowed what I was doing till it was pitch dark, and I heard Delilah's voice calling me to the house. Then I 
knew what I'd done in anger, I'd, I'd done right. There'd be a mighty heap of food and crops needed and needed quick. And I was getting my land ready, I was, every inch of it. If an army moves on its stomach, so to say, then Jared Tucker, he was going to help keep it moving. And believe it or not, ma'am, I come back into that kitchen a younger man. And that night I heard the president speaking over Delilah's radio. Well, the anger left me. Instead, I had hope and faith in the gall dangest bump of determination you ever seen. Well, on you, Mr. Tucker, it must have been quite a bump. Like Gibraltar it was. And sure growed as I heard the president saying, The true goal we seek is far above and beyond the ugly field of battle. When we resort to force, as now we must, we are determined that this force shall be directed toward ultimate good. We Americans are not destroyers. We are builders. That's what he says. That's what the man who was president said. Not destroyers, but builders. Yep. Out of the ruins and the ashes we can build. And we did build during the war. We found we had considerable strength. And it sure strikes me as being a terrible shame if we let that strength fritter itself to waste because we ain't at war. I'm looking for the men who'd work to build together instead of working to destroy together, who've the will to harness for a decent living. If, if I could find a world full of them or even a half a world full, we sure wouldn't have no more Pearl Harbor days. That's a cinch. Well, <clears throat> gabbled myself horse in the face, and I ain't even going to apologize for it. You bet you're not. How dark it's gotten out. Eh, uh, talk's darn much here. You haven't had a chance to do your work. <laughs> My work can wait. Yes, darling. I know now you've more urgent business on hand. So, Mr. Tucker, pull up a chair. Let's make some plans, because I accept your proposition. When spring comes, we'll work our fields together. My labor, your machinery. And every inch of fertile ground will yield. Yep. Now you're talking, son. Now you are talking. Then it's a deal, neighbor? It sure is a deal, neighbor. Standing around in shops waiting your turn can be a bore. But if there's a Coke cooler handy, that's another story. For then you can drop in a nickel, get yourself a frosty bottle of sparkling Coca-Cola, and shop refreshed. Hey, uh, Mr. King, hitch up your jaw a minute if you can. I'll hitch it up till you tell me to unhitch it, Mr. Tucker. Well, all I want to say is we sure worked out a fine scheme for working our land. Well, that's very fine news. Uh, congratulations on being so farsighted. But you're not the only one. I didn't say I was. Who else? Claudia. Claudia. Huh? David has to get off to an early start in the morning, and Claudia is farsighted, and she's organizing everything to make it easy for him. <laughs> yeah, but does she? Oh, does she? That's the question, Mr. Tucker. Well, see you tomorrow. Well, uh, uh, you know what I think? Uh, I think you're just stringing me along. Well, you can unhitch your jaw now, Mr. King, and talk. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. This broadcast of Claudia was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. And now, here's a word from your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. <laughs>